It is my honor to introduce our plenary speaker, Dr. Vivi Arian Renandia. Dr. Renandia is a language teacher educator with extensive teaching experience in Asia. He currently teaches applied linguistics courses at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He has given numerous plenary presentations at regional and international conferences and published extensively in the area of second language education. His latest publications include Simple Powerful Strategies for Student-Centered Learning with George Jacobs and um, Student-Centered Cooperative Learning with George Jacobs. He maintains an active language teacher professional development forum called Teacher Voices. Thank you. Let's welcome Dr. Renandia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jin Yi. I so enjoyed your presentation yesterday. And Professor Liu, your presentation was just excellent. I've heard a lot about CSE, uh, but now I think I know a bit more about CSE. I think I need to invite you to my uh, to my uh, university to give a special talk to my students. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, let me introduce to you my university very briefly. Uh, the name of the university is Nanyang Technological University. It's a very good university. And uh, I belong to the School of Education within the university. Uh, locally, it's known as the National Institute of Education. The reason I mentioned this is th because I have a lot of students from China doing their masters and doing their doctoral uh, program uh, in applied linguistics in language education and related uh, areas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation today is captured using these two diagrams. In, in the past, I think there were a lot of divergent views about English language teaching. But today, I think we are seeing a more converging path towards ELT. Uh, people tend to agree with each other. Researchers, uh, language education theorists, TESOL specialists tend to agree with each other uh, regarding what is important uh, in language teaching, what is important in helping students develop their English language proficiency. Very briefly, in the past, People were arguing a great deal about whether we should be teaching language as knowledge or teaching language as ability. In the past, people were also arguing about the importance of monolingualism, the idea that we should be using English all the time. But these days, people are more open-minded. People are more receptive to the ideas that students can learn using whatever linguistic resources they have available, uh, L1, L2, L3, and things like that. Again, in the past, we were discussing, we were debating whether native English speak speaking teachers or non-native English speaking teachers are better in terms of helping students, supporting students in the classroom. I think we understand better now that we need both, you know, uh, to help students develop their English language proficiency. I'm so happy, uh, you know, listening to Professor Liu's presentation uh, just now. Uh, in the past, we were focusing mostly on assessment of learning. But these days, I think we are also embracing the ideas of assessment for learning and also assessment uh, as learning. Again, in the past, people were debating whether input is more important than output or output is more important than input. We now have come to an agreement that both are needed for uh, language development. Also, in the past, we were uh, debating vigorously, uh, you know, rigorously about a number of designer methods, which one or well, which method is good, which method is not so good. I think we now are in agreement that we need to learn from the best ideas uh, that people have used in the classroom and then uh, sort of develop our own ways of teaching using uh, a hybrid method of teaching. So my presentation today is basically about, you know, a number of principles that we can use to help our students develop their English language uh, proficiency. And I will summarize my presentations using this acronym, Flamingos. So at the end of the presentation, you should be able to remember some of the big ideas that I am sharing with you today. So eight principles all together. 
Let me begin with the first one. The first one is F. F stands for fluency. The idea behind fluency is, I think, something that most of you are familiar with. But surprisingly, at least according to Paul Nation, and I will spot his ideas as well, that fluency has not been given enough attention in the classroom. Now, that is something that we need to be, uh, you know, uh, paying attention. Uh, in fact, there's been a serious neglect. Uh, what, what, what teachers normally do when they walk, in, walk into the classroom is they tend to introduce new, you know, uh, language points or new teaching points, forgetting that for students to learn to acquire, uh, you know, a new grammatical item, for example, they will need to be able to see or, or be able to practice the language item again and again and again. There's also this misconception about what fluency means. I think we need to understand that fluency means practicing what the students already know. Let me say that again. Fluency means practicing or giving students opportunity to practice what they already know. And they have to do it again and again until they become better at it. And that is how you develop fluency. If you look at this picture, for example, a badminton player who is undergoing a very rigorous practice session with a coach. Yeah. The player is already good and he is practicing again and again what he already knows how to do so that he can do it more fluently, so that he can do it more accurately. He can place the shuttle court at the uh, you know, difficult position in the opponent's court. So fast, accurate, and quick. So that is what fluency practice is all about. So. Like they say, practice makes perfect. In English language teaching, I think we need to remember this, that we need to give students opportunities to do a lot of repeated listening, to do a lot of repeated reading, to do a lot of repeated writing and repeated speaking as well. So daily listening to English, for example, is a very good thing for the students to do because that is one way for them to improve on their listening fluency, which later can be translated into, uh, you know, uh, into speaking skills. That's point number one. F is for fluency. L is for lexis or vocabulary. I think you know, I know, you know, everyone knows that vocabulary is important. Let me share with you two quotes. Yeah, very important quotes to remember. The first one is by Wilkin from many years ago. Without grammar, very little can be conveyed. Without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. Yeah, that gives special attention to the importance of vocabulary. And more recently, Alderson also mentioned about the importance of vocabulary. In fact, if you look at one's ability to use the language fluently and accurately, yeah, research tells us that language ability is, to a large extent, a function of vocabulary size. So the more words you know, the more able uh, you will be in terms of using language for speaking, reading, writing, and uh, listening. Again, from research, we know this, the importance of knowing words. After years of research, one vocabulary researcher has this to say, text comprehension depends heavily on detailed knowledge of most of the words in the text. If you are looking for a figure, a number, in terms of how many words do you need to know in order for you to be able to understand a piece of text, the figure is very high actually, about 95 to 98%, or ideally 100%. If you know most of the words, then chances are your comprehension will be greatly uh, facilitated. Roughly, in terms of the number of words that our students need to know, I would say about three to 5,000 words. More is good, but uh, if you can keep you know, this uh, figure in mind, helping students to acquire 3,000 to 5,000 words during their uh, school years, I think you'll have done a good job. More importantly, though, I think this is also supported by research, that number of words is one thing, but the other one is how well the students know the words is also very important. They need to know the multiple meaning of words because words have different meanings when they're used in different contexts. 
students need to also learn how to use words appropriately, uh, you know, in a way that is acceptable socially and culturally. And uh, depth also allows students to use language uh, creatively. Let me give you an example of the word give here. The word give has many different meanings, actually, depending on how you use the word give in a sentence. Give it back to me. I think that's very common. Uh, number two is another example is I give you my word. The meaning is slightly different. And I, she gave her all to save her child. Again, the same word is used here, but the meaning is not the same. He gave me the flu. That is another uh, way of saying that, hey, I've been you know, exposed to the flu because of this person uh, standing in front of me. I'll give it a shot. And finally, frankly, dear, I don't give a, you don't have to say that, yeah? So a variety of ways, a simple word like give can be used to express a wide variety of meaning. Now, <clears throat> if you have depth, if you know words very well, then you may be able to use the words playfully and also creatively. Now, here is an example. <clears throat> Again, the same word, give, I went to the doctor and he gave me two months to live. So I shot him. The judge gave me 30 years. So which one is better, two months or 30 years? The second one is better, yeah? Okay, number three. So the first one is fluency, number two is laxis, and number three is amount and intensity of instruction. A actually stands for amounts, but after listening to Professor Liu just now, I have added intensity. I think intensity is very, very important. Let me just briefly share my thoughts about the importance of amount and intensity in supporting students' language development. On the left-hand side, we have the amount, the number of hours that, of instruction that our students receive roughly 1,000 hours or slightly more than 1,000 hours. The question is, is that enough? The answer is yes, that is enough. More than enough to get the students to uh, uh, a moderately high level of proficiency in the English language. The intensity, however, is six years or sometimes longer. That is something that we need to rethink. I don't think that is a very good idea to have such a long duration to get the students to learn the uh, English language. My suggestion is this, keep the number of hours constant, about 1,000, 1,200, that's more than enough, but increase the intensity of instruction, maybe three years, shorter if possible. I think intensity is what allows students to do a lot of wonderful things, uh, learning, relearning, recycling, consolidating, developing fluency, uh, and things like that, yeah? So A is for amount and intensity of instruction. Number four is M. M is for motivation. I think everyone in the room agrees that motivation is important. In fact, somebody mentioned this a long time ago, that in education, there are three things that are important. Number one is motivation. Number two is motivation. And number three is also uh, motivation. Zoltan Donye, one of the top guys in second language uh, motivation has this to say, which I am sharing with you now. I think he's basically saying that if you want your students to be able to get to a decent level of proficiency, I think they need to have sufficient motivation. I think working knowledge here is somewhere in the uh, B1 or maybe B2 level uh, of proficiency uh, in the CFR scale. Let me give you a quiz. Motivation is important, yes? I'm sure you'll, you will say yes together with me. Number two, I know how to motivate my students. I hope you do, but after talking to many teachers from different parts of the world, a lot of the, the teachers that I've spoken to actually say that they know very little about how to motivate their students in the classroom. They know that motivation is important, but in terms of the actual technical skills that they need to, to use in the classroom, they know very uh, little. And number three, 
one big question for everyone. My students in the classroom are motivated. The answer can range from a little bit motivated, maybe about 30% are motivated, maybe about 50% are motivated, but never or rarely have I heard people saying that my students, 100% of my students are motivated. A big question for me is this, is motivation a student problem or is it a teacher problem or both? After thinking about these issues for many years, actually I've come to the conclusion that motivation is a teacher problem. Motivation is something the teacher will have to deal with, something that you need to work hard to help your students to become motivated and also to stay motivated for one whole year, for two years, for three years, and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's more of a teacher problem. The interesting thing is this. When you ask teachers whether motivation is a student problem or a teacher problem, they will say it's a student problem. But when you do ask students whether it's a student problem or a teacher problem, almost all of the students will say it's a teacher problem. My teacher is not very interesting. My teacher is, you know, what I mean. So ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to reframe, we need to rethink our pedagogy. I think for many years we've been, we've been spending too much time on the first one, building knowledge, building skills in the classroom, teaching a variety of language skills to our students, forgetting, forgetting that where learning is concerned, where English language learning is concerned, I think students need a lot of will and they need to feel a lot of excitement in the classroom. I remember what Professor Liu said just now. If you look at your students and your students are laughing with you, smiling, big smiles on their faces, I think you know that you've been very successful. So I think we need to do a lot more of that, creating the interest, creating the motivation, and more importantly, creating this feeling of excitement uh, in your English language classroom, yeah? So remember the skill, the will, and the thrill. I think we need to focus more on the will and the thrill. The skill is important, but that I think more importantly is for the students to be excited so that they will be willing to learn more in the classroom and also outside the classroom. Yeah. I will leave you with this. Uh, again, a quote from Donye. The best motivational intervention is simply to improve the quality of our teaching. So it's more of a teaching problem or teacher problem than a student problem. If you want to know more about motivation, I've got these two you know, excellent uh, you know, literature references. Uh, I will make this available to you if you are uh, interested. They're available online in my website. I'll show you the uh, uh, web address at the end of my presentation. Next one, input. N is for input. Again, let me begin with this quote from a couple of uh, second language acquisition specialists. I think they're trying to describe this knowledge that we have in our head, the linguistic knowledge, the linguistic system that we have in our head, which allows us, which enables us to produce language, either in writing, in speaking, and in many other areas of language learning. Let me read this to you very carefully. This complex, this linguistic system is complex and implicit. It is not dependent on learner practice of language, but rather is dependent on exposure to what is called input. So the key thing to remember here is, I think we need to spend a bit more time uh, helping our students to be exposed to the language to receive rich and optimal uh, input in the classroom and also uh, outside the classroom. In the past, there was a lot of discussion whether input is necessary and sufficient. I think we have now come to an agreement that yes, it is necessary, but it's not sufficient condition for language acquisition. But what we are saying here is that both are important. So don't just focus on the, on the sufficiency issue, but we need also to pay attention to the, uh, the first bit, which is necessary, it's a precondition for English language learning to happen. So without input, not much can happen in your English language classroom. And to me, input is a great acquisition enabler. 
it will take the students all the way to mid or intermediate level of proficiency. If, if, if you want them to go higher, then this is where explicit systematic teaching of the language of the discourse structures become very, very uh, important. Let me show you some, uh, a number of uh, successful English language learners from different parts of uh, Asia. Uh, the girl here is from Korea. She has, you know, since young, she was, ex she, 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 she exposed herself to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, language, uh, reading books, listening to music, listening to or watching movies. And uh, at the end of the day, she was able to develop a very high proficiency in the English language. Here is another example, a girl from Thailand. Uh, she shared with me that she watched a lot of cartoon movies. And because of that, she was able to develop a very high proficiency in the language. Another uh, example from Vietnam, this young man uh, is an avid reader. He enjoyed reading all types of books and his English was again, excellent. He took the IELTS test and his speaking skill uh, was seven and a half. A teacher, again, she is from Indonesia. Indonesia is very much like China and other EFL countries, but this teacher was able to develop a very high proficiency in the English language just by watching a lot of movies. The same thing with this teacher. Uh, she also uh, did a lot of viewing uh, back then, watching Laura Ingalls, for example, uh, Little Girl on the Prairie, and uh, her English is just wonderful. Again, if you want to know more about why input is important, uh, let me share with you these two books. Again, they are freely available in my website. The first one is the primacy of reading and listening, basically. That is how we can provide a lot of input to our students. Uh, this one I did with Professor Richard Day. It's a book chapter. Uh, the other one is the journal article, The Power of Series Books, that I uh, co-authored with Stephen Crescent and George Jacobs. Next one, G is for grammar. G is for grammar. Let me pose this question to you. Uh, Yolanda, are you there, Yolanda? To teach or not to teach grammar, that is choose one. What would you say? You can say it in your head, is or is not. <laughs> I think the answer is, is not. That is not the question. I think we now know that we have to teach grammar. Yeah, you and I, and a lot of experts agree that yes, we need to teach grammar. But the question is, do we need to teach all the wonderful grammatical rules or the grammatical features in the English language? The answer is no. We have to focus on the most useful ones. Yeah, the rest, I think the students can develop their own you know, grammatical knowledge along the way. Once they have reached a certain level of English language proficiency, I think they'll be able to move on. They'll be able to take off and learn a lot of things on their own. So the idea behind self-directed, uh, self-determined uh, learning, basically. I think in our teaching, we need to focus more on what has been considered core grammatical features of the English language. Here are some examples. There are a few more. How to use simple sentences or how to use compound sentences, for example, that I think is important. How to use verbs correctly in the English language, that also is very important. Tenses, those are important. How to ask questions, I think that is very important. How to say no, for example. Yeah, there are 100 different ways of saying no in the English language. And there are many other examples that you may want to uh, consider. But the starting point is always choose the kind of grammar that you want to teach according to the needs of the student at what level they are at, whether they are at the early uh, stage of learning, at the uh, you know, later stage of learning. What about this? What about these grammatical features? Not only, but also. Had I met you earlier, I would. Little did I know, it's imperative that every teacher be given a higher salary, for example. Do you think we need to spend a lot of time teaching this grammatical features in the English language? Well, this man says, I think we should go easy on this. Yeah. 
it's okay for you to expose your students to these grammatical features to explain very briefly, but don't spend the whole day explaining how to use not only, but also had I met you earlier, I would have done, you know, things like that. Yeah. So my advice again is very straightforward, focus on the more important language points, some of the most useful language points in the English language, the rest, I think you can just mention very briefly and uh, let the students uh, later develop uh, this uh, grammatical knowledge uh, on their own. Next one is output. Again, this is another, uh, or this was a very interesting and contentious uh, issue in the past. Which one is more important, input, output? I think both are important. We know that output is important because we want our students to engage in syntactic processing, turning ideas into grammatical, grammatically acceptable forms, and also articulating uh, you know, these language forms in speech or in writing. Uh, output is important also for students to receive feedback, self-feedback, and also feedback from other uh, you know, people so that they can revise, they can rethink, they can further develop their uh, interlanguage. Uh, output is also very important for motivational purposes. You know, some students feel you know, demotivated because they have never had a chance to use uh, the language for some authentic uh, purposes. Output is also good for fluency development, the ability to produce language easily, quickly, and with accuracy, and with greater comprehension is possible when you provide students with a lot of output uh, opportunities. But remember, we need to keep a balance. Input is also important. Input allows students to engage in meaning, in uh, semantic processing. It helps students to strengthen their initial learning. It helps the students to see again words, phrases, grammatical features that they have just learned from the teacher. So it allows a lot of restructuring, consolidation to happen in their uh, linguistic system. In other words, think about this, the yin and the yang of language learning. I think we need both uh, with different emphasis, with a different uh, focus at different times of learning. As I said early on, output allows students to develop a higher degree of fluency, a higher degree of accuracy, and uh, being able to produce more complex language and also to use language more appropriately, one that is socially and culturally acceptable. And in recent years, I think we need to remember that we should not focus too much on native speaker competence. I think these days uh, we are more concerned with helping students uh, you know, develop the kind of uh, language proficiency, uh, the kind of speech and writing that is intelligible, acceptable, and number three, I think very important, I think this is from Andy's presentation yesterday, also credible. I think it's very important that when you speak or when you write, uh, people take you seriously, that what you say is meaningful, that what you say is credible, and you are able to say things with authority. Just like Jin Yi Peng yesterday, wow, she was so good uh, when she talked about WTC. Professor Liu just now, wow, that was really, really a highly credible presentation. This is the last one, S. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, S stands for set phrases. In the literature, it's also known as formulaic expressions, lexical bundles, and uh, fixed phrases or fixed expressions. Whatever you call it, this apparently is extremely important where language acquisition is concerned. Let me share with you a story. This is a story that was, that was recounted in a journal article that was published in System uh, a few years ago. The story of successful English language learners in China. Now, these are students, high school students, who develop a very high level of proficiency and who took part in the national uh, English language competition. Now, these are things that they did. You know, they are winners. They, 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 they said they spent a lot of time practicing uh, the English language. And some of the students mentioned that they listen again and again and again to the same, uh, you know, listening materials. This is what some of them said, as reported in that uh, uh, journal article. 
Very interesting. I was slow in the beginning. I had to listen to it many more times. No big deal here, yeah? But what happens next is this. I gradually developed some feel of the language. What does this feel mean, actually? This is what she means. I feel that I just have countless numbers of patterns sort of swimming uh, around in my head. Lines from movies often naturally pop out. Now, these are what I call you know, fixed expressions. They're not just vocabulary. They're not just grammar. They are both grammar and vocabulary merged into one. And they become what has been called lexical bundles or fixed expressions or lexical chunks. Now, these are some examples of lexical chunks, things that you learn because you have seen this many times and this expression sort of stick in your head. Yeah, some additional examples. I think you can look it up on Google and you'll be able to find thousands and thousands of these expressions. These expressions are important because these are what enable us, competent speakers, to produce language effortlessly, automatically, fluently, and also uh, accurately. Ladies and gentlemen, my flamingos, eight principles. Uh, Jin E, do you remember these eight principles, the flamingos, the F is for? I'm giving you a quiz, Jin E. F is for? Fluency. Fluence, very good. L is for? Uh, Lexus. Lexus. Yes, A is for? Amount, amount and intensity of instruction. You are very good. M is motivation. for? Motivation. In is for input. input. G is for grammar. grammar. O is for output. Yes, and S, the last one, is for set, set phrases. Expressions, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's all for me. Uh, from me. Uh, if you want to know more about some of the ideas that I presented, please feel free to come to my or visit my website. It has a lot of resources that will help you, your graduate students, and your also school students to learn. Uh, more about the English language. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Renandia, for sharing the fascinating concept of flamingos, which encapsulates the part and parcel issues in ELT. Now, please allow me to introduce our last and renowned keynote. Got three wonderful uh, presentations. Um, First of all, from uh, Professor Liu, uh, Liu Jianda, and it's a really so full of uh, rich information and, and also all the wonderful things that you are doing with your students, uh, innovating. Um, I, would, I would say uh, it's a gamification, uh, gamification of uh, learning and assessment um, because you are wonderfully um, integrating formative assessment with a kind of e-platform, with self-study, with uh, auto automatically recorded uh, uh, results, which can turn into a like a, like a, like a, uh, like in a game in 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 video game. You can have uh, different course cons course cons, right? So. A lot of these uh, gamification features have been shown in, lit in the literature to be very useful in motivating uh, students to motivate themselves so that they have self-motivation to learn. Um, so it's, it's such a wonderful work that you have been doing and pioneering. And when you show the, um, the handwritten <laughs> assessment records that you persuaded your wife and your students and then later on when you change to when you change to this e-platform wow so my question to professor to professor liu is um is um for um you have 2500 descriptors for the cse the college mm. uh the uh, china english descriptors um I was wondering for this uh, auto platform, this e platform, which is so wonderful, um, how does it how does it deal with the more expressive dimensions of proficiency? Like in the descriptors you you show, like um, how to use language to persuade, to explain, to
to convey, and, and I would add to debate. So these are more um, complex abilities or expressive dimensions of proficiency. Um, how, how can you use this uh, gamified e-platform to, to, to assess a student's expressive um, proficiency abilities to persuade, to explain, to, I would add to debate, which is a kind of very expressive ability in, in, in a language. So I, I like to, I'm just curious to, to learn how to do that uh, using a uh, gamified e-platform. That's for Professor Liu. And, um, and really, um, Professor Renandia, oh, you're such a wonderful presenter. I have learned so much from your presentation of how your, how your PowerPoint is made and how you present the eight principles using the acronym of Flamingos. Mm -hmm. Now I will forever remember these eight <laughs> principles. It's so wonderfully, so wonderfully presented to all of us. And, and also, you have uh, integrated and given us this review of today's uh, ELT today, and also reviewing the old debates, but now converging into the new consensus in our field, which is so good for us to, to have this comprehensive picture. And you presented it so nicely in this uh, wonderful presentation. And, um, and especially this, um, this interview you have with this student, she was saying she was a successful learner and she was saying it's kind of like countless patterns swimming in my, in my head. So this is so useful, these, uh, these set phrases. Now, um, my question for really for Professor Renandia is um, you, you are very, um, bold to say that if there is a motivation problem, it's a teacher problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now I know we have uh, 59 participants, and I think 100% of the participants here are teachers. <laughs> so um, if one of our teachers here asks you, okay, mm. it's my problem <laughs> if, 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 if students' motivation is an issue. Now, um, and um, how could you help me to solve this problem if, like in mm. China, in Singapore, or in Asia, uh, mm. Southeast Asia, students are under a lot of exam pressure. Um, mm. They actually would just want to say, teacher, just show me how to get a good grade, how to pass my Gaokao, how to get mm. full marks, and don't try to build my Feel my thrill, uh, feel my. <laughs> don't don't try to excite me. I don't want to be excited. I want to have one hundred percent. If students are so bent on instrumental yeah. kind mm. of motivation, now mm. you say, according to Professor Renandia, this is my problem. I'm a teacher. <laughs> so how? I'm not saying instrumental motivation is not useful. It's hugely, mm. hugely useful. However, if you want to. Uh, build students free, build students will beyond just the uh, test, the, the, the Gaokao or the standardized test, which, which as we have learned is not very representative of your ability to actually com communicate in a language. So how would you help me, a teacher, to solve this motivation problem, which you mm. allocate, you attribute to me as a teacher problem? Okay. <laughs> Good but question. So much, really. And then yeah. Professor Wang, Professor Wang Haixiao's uh, presentation is so wonderful again. The digital literacy is for college English teachers and uh, all the awareness, the knowledge, the abilities uh, along the different dimensions that we need to help uh, teachers to college English teachers to build up um, it is really uh, a demanding task, and but it's a good it is a good uh, roadmap for college English teachers uh, to aspire to. Now, if I am a teacher in my fifties, <laughs> indeed I am, <laughs> and, uh, I'm, and my students' digital knowledge is profoundly deeper than mine. If okay, mm. and I'm a college English teacher.
Mm. And I, I, I don't want to lose face in front of my students. I know, I know teachers should be humble and should be modest, should be learning from our students. Still in a lot of uh, East Asian cultures, um, admitting that I am actually a latecomer <laughs> to the digital age. And I'm a foreigner <laughs> in the digital <laughs> world. And as a college English teacher, what would be your advice, Professor Wang, uh, before I'm overwhelmed with all these, uh, all these demands to increase my awareness, my knowledge, my abilities, along all these multiple dimensions, just give me uh, the first step so that I can overcome, overcome the threshold of, uh, of, uh, of insecurity. <laughs> so this is my uh, question for Professor Wang. And uh, I, am, I'm, I want to say I couldn't express how grateful I am to today's free speakers, free keynote speakers. It's so wonderful, so wonderful. I've learned so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. And next, please. Okay, and you, thank you for your wonderful question. Uh, actually, so what we have been doing these days uh, is to try our best to, you know, teach or advise English teachers in China to apply CSC in the English teaching. And uh, uh, the kind of uh, feedback or responses that we got from the teachers that they, they don't know how to use CSC in their teaching or assessment. So we are trying to do different th kind of things for example, we have recorded a series of, uh, you know, MOOCs or short talks, uh, and we posted them on, 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 on online, so that teachers in China or in the world can they can watch those videos and then they get to know CSE better, and uh, uh, they can follow the suggestions how to use uh, CSE in their teaching. As far as the kind of uh, the kind of uh, uh, C the, the, the kind of a CSE application in assessing the kind of expressive proficiency or like uh, those debates between uh, the dis debates or those, those kind of, uh, what we say, the kind of performances. Uh, so uh, here I want to say that CSE can be applied in assessing English proficiency, but CSE can also should, uh, should also be used, I mean, creatively. Uh, it's not a, just to follow a line by line or, 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 or strictly follow CSE. CSE only provides a kind of uh, you know standards for you to to, to to refer to, and actually in in the real kind of world uh, assessment of uh, like uh, listening ability, speaking ability, or other abilities, you need to refer to CSE, and also teachers are encouraged to add something more according to their real situation, like uh, you want to focus on some other aspects. So you can include some of the descriptors from the CSE. I, I, meanwhile, you may add your own. So the, the kind of uh, CSE informed application in English language teaching and English assessment. So, uh, so we 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 uh, try to uh, teach the, st uh, the teachers to use the CSE not 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 direct. It's, it's not so much directly, but use them creatively. So, uh, informative assessment are very important. So we try to teach the teachers to mean to get to, 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 to take uh, part of the CSE to suit maybe one of the tasks, for example, writing, for example, listening, speaking, or something, and uh, they may combine other things. So this is what we we are. Uh, uh, try to give in the teachers in China here advice on how to use CSE in their English teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu. Uh, Professor Rinaldi. Oh, uh, yes, my turn. Yes, thank you so much, you. Angel, uh, for the uh, wonderful, wonderful question. You are 50 this year, I'm 51, so we are on the same age. <laughs> we are on the same page. Uh, yes. Uh, Angel, I mentioned in my presentation, you know, that motivation is, is a funny thing. You know, if, 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 if when you ask students about whether motivation is their problem or 
or is is it more like a teacher problem? They'll say that it's a teacher problem. So so it's not me saying that it's a teacher problem, but it's it's the students basically. But over the years, I've been thinking about this issue a lot, and I and I feel that we can do better in terms of improving uh, the way we do things uh, in the classroom. Uh, let me share with you uh, six ideas. I'm going to say it very quickly, though. Six ideas, all starting with T, the letter T. Yeah. So six T's from me. The first T is the teacher. I think there are a lot of wonderful teachers there. But one thing that you may want to try to, uh, to do is to try to make yourself more likable in the classroom. Likeability is so, so uh, important. We are all social beings, and we like to get along with people, with teachers that, that are likable. So that is one big job for us to make ourselves more likable. And one thing to do is to not say that I'm a likable person. Try to like your students first. Yeah, if you like your students, if you show, demonstrate this to your students, chances are very high that they will reciprocate to you. So likability is number one. Build good rapport with the students as well. That is always a starting point for the students to get them excited, motivated about uh, learning. Number two is teaching methodology. Yes, there are wonderful, wonderful teachers out there, uh, but I think they can do much, much more in terms of using a wider range of teaching methodology, lecture, lecture style occasionally, but I think we should also be trying out different ways of doing things. Uh, discovery learning, inquiry-based learning, flipped classroom, uh, seminar style of learning. Yeah, so variety in teaching uh, methodology. The third T is the text, the materials that we are using. I think we need to try to make our our materials as interesting, as relevant as possible, even using PowerPoint slides. Uh, it took me years to realize that my PowerPoint slides are often my teaching materials. So I need to work so hard to make my teaching materials, my slides interesting, appealing uh, for my students. Uh, if you are teaching content courses, for example, do not just depend solely on academic texts reading articles from big journals. These are difficult to read. Yes, we do want the students to read those articles, but you can give them something that is lighter to get them started. Something from Edutopia, for example, something from Psychology Today, and something from you know a lot of websites out there that produce very, very interesting. TED is my favorite. So get the students excited about their lesson before they read the big you know, chapter from a big book tell them to read or to watch a TED video. So that way the students get more interested, more curious, uh, you know, to find out more about the topic. So that is T number three. T number four is the task. The task is so important. We want our students to be fully engaged when they are doing their task, behaviorally, emotionally, very important. They have to feel safe. They have to feel happy, cognitively, stretch them a little bit, and also socially, allow them to interact, to share their experiences, their ideas with their peers. Yeah, so that's a task. And finally, not finally, number five is the test. Yes, it's not very easy to tweak the test, but after listening to Professor Liu just now, I've become more convinced that the way to go is not to rely uh, on just one big test the big summative uh, examination, the big Gaokao, for example, but to break it up into smaller units, you know, and, and if you look at assessment for learning and as learning, I think the students will get a bit more excited. And finally, technology. The last T is technology. So six T's altogether, technology. Technology is just wonderful. After listening to Professor Wang just now, I've become more convinced that technology is the way to go. We need to keep ourselves you know, up to date in terms of how we can use digital resources for uh, teaching purposes. The past 12 months, I've been learning a lot about how I can use technology to engage uh, my students in the classroom. One last sentence, Angel. One last sentence is this. I think we need to develop our persuasion skill in the classroom. So this is what I do. Every time I walk into the classroom, I will tell my students, Today's lesson is the most important lesson of the year. And 
the topic that I'm discussing today will appear in the examination. How about that? And they believe you basically, you know, and they'll pay attention. Oh, okay, today's lesson is for the big examination. So I'm going to listen very carefully and very attentively. Thank you again, Angel. Wonderful, wonderful question. Thanks for the 60s again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Renandia, for your excellent elaboration on your 60s. Thank you. And then Professor Wang. Yeah, thank okay. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Ling. And uh, uh, we, uh, after the uh, Flamingo, we have got uh, 60s. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, I was counting, you know, how, how many teeth I, I have in my mouth. <laughs> Right. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Ling, for, for the for the question and uh, for, for, for 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 the comment for the first, and then for for the questions. And thank you for raising this question on actually on behalf of almost all the language teachers of the world, not only in China, but uh, uh, as we are kind of um, you know developing our understandings of language learning and teaching more requirements for the competencies for, for the literacies for language teachers are, are emerging and we are doing, you know, doing this multiplication uh, uh, for um, language teachers kind of uh, every day. Um, this is why I kind of, uh, I, I, in, in my talk, I emphasized the three-stage development. Uh, we have to start from awareness and, uh, well, um, if, if there can be kind of a differentiation between knowledge, the, between the amount of knowledge we have and between the, abili the abilities we have uh, for different generations of language users and, you know, uh, but uh, and, um, I guess for language teachers, we could develop uh, awareness first. Um, as, as language educators, in, and aware of the importance of, of technology use and, you know, how it influences uh, the nature of la language and language use and language learning and language teaching. So this awareness can be developed ahead of, uh, you know, and, and, um, can, and, and can be developed al along with the changing uh, in our, uh, uh, with the changes in our society. And this actually belongs to the sphere of, of language educators. Um, uh, students may, 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 may be able to proficiently use technology, but they may not be aware of the importance of, of, of uh, how you know, um, technology has influenced. And, and then after you know, the, the, the development of, of this awareness, they, you know, some teachers can develop some knowledge some, you know, uh, in certain uh, areas of, of technology application in, um, in, 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 um, in language learning and teaching. So that's uh, the first thing that I would um, uh, emphasize. We are not expecting all teachers to be to be proficient in, you know, in all uh, areas of, of, of uh, technology application um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, awareness and, 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 and knowledge and abilities. You know, some people may be more proficient in one way or another, right? So that's, that's kind of one thing. And uh, the second thing is, is that we understand that um, nowadays we, when, when, the, the one uh, important aspect, an, an important influence that technology uh, has had on our learning and teaching is that we no longer regard students as, uh, as, as you know, passive receivers. As we are talking about, um, you know, uh, the use of uh, information technology, the same principle should also be applied here. So teachers are not there to teach the students the use of technology all the time. If we, if we, if we you know, take the position of a teacher in terms of technology use all the time, we are, we are kind of uh, doing the contrary of our understanding of the, of the nature of, 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 of technology you know, use. You know, with the, the um, application of, of information technology, we are empowering our learners in their learning and we, are, we should also, in terms of you know, uh, the, the, the use of technology, we should also believe in the power of the students in using technology to enhance their own learning and even to enhance teachers' teaching. So they, they, they should have also the power to participate as masters 
as, uh, you know, um, as uh, um, uh, in the learning <laughs> and even teaching yes. process. Yes. So this is uh, my understanding of, 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 of how teachers can, can first of all, you know, um, uh, overcome, you know, overcome the difficulties that the, 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 the task may impose on, on them in terms of developing, first of all, their awareness and developing their uh, you know their, their 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 understanding of of the of the role of students uh, that students can play in the learning process. So in in uh, in this way, uh, teachers can grow together as students, and 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 and, of, and and finally, different students can grow in different ways, and different teachers can also develop themselves in different ways. They can develop you know develop their expertise in different aspects of 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 of, of um, technology use. So um, uh, I would, you know, use this opportunity to 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 to, to tell my colleagues, you know, uh, in here in China and, and, and all over the world, there's nothing to worry about. There are all, all the teachers, and there are all, all the wonderful teachers in every student that we teach, and they can, you know, help us uh, grow as we uh, move along in our teaching. Thank you. Can I just add one sentence to that, uh, Angel? Mm. Yeah, I think we should lead by example. I think modeling is one of the best ways to get students excited about using or learning uh, digital literacies. Uh, in my case, for example, the past 12 months, I have developed my transmedia skill. Transmedia is, is, is like a, a form of digital literacy. I learned how to blog. Mm. I think that's a new way of doing things nowadays. If you want to reach out to people, blogging is one way of doing it. Yeah, communicating to people using social media or to your students using social media using wechat whatsapp and things like that i think we need to learn that different media requires the use of different uh, style of writing different uh, language usage i've created my youtube channel recently that's another form of communication Great. Uh, i already have a website now and uh, i now learn how to turn a regular paper into uh, an ebook very beautiful looking ebook. Learning how to use an ebook uh, maker application. Uh, Google Slides, you know, how to present your ideas in slides that, that are shareable using Google Slides or other, other media. So, so the key thing to remember is if we want changes to happen, I think we should start from us. Thank you. We should and lead I should start by from learning example. From you, really. yeah. Yeah. I should start from learning from you, really. So mm. um, now could I invite you to appear on my uh, channel? I have started a channel um, to invite uh, scholars and researchers to give mm. seminars. So now I'm booking you. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lin, <laughs> Professor Wang, Prof Professor Liu, and Professor Rilan. Thank you very much for your insights. Now, uh, since we are running out of time for the Q&A section, probably we can offer one question uh, from the uh, on-site audience. Uh, 